As our subject of value is to be based largely upon a Zen concept, I think it might be appropriate and quite proper to use a Zen example. The greatest of all Zen artists was the Japanese painter Seshu. Seshu lived from 1420 to about 1506. There is some minor confusion as to the exact date of his death. The life and character of Seshu is rather unique, inasmuch as perhaps he is the only artist in Asia, and possibly the only artist in the world, about whose superiority there is no argument. Among the Japanese people, for example, it makes no difference, really, whether you are a connoisseur or uh, perhaps merely a shopkeeper or a grocer or a woodcutter. If you ask any of these people the name of their greatest artist, the answer will always be Seshu. This in itself is rather interesting, culturally speaking. Because it is not often that we find an artist, musician, or a literati in any level who is universally acceptable. Most uh, brilliant leaders are acceptable only to persons in their own level, in their own general area of thinking. But here we have an artist who not only is acceptable to all of the people of his country, but breaks another traditional precedent. He is acceptable to the Chinese. Now this is more of a condescension than you might at first imagine, because very largely the Chinese regard, regarded in the classical period at least, uh, almost all other nations as barbaric, and nearly all other individuals barbarians that they should recognize a Japanese artist is therefore one of the highest tributes that can be paid uh, to creative genius in Asia. There is a reason, of course, perhaps, why they have a certain sympathy for Seshu, because during his rather long and interesting career, he visited China and remained for a number of months studying Chinese art techniques. He therefore bridged the two schools in an astonishing way. But if he uh, belonged to both China and Japan, it was largely because Zen belonged to both China and Japan. And his attainments in these areas of artistic specialization won him recognition in both countries. Not long ago, I happened to be reading over an art criticism dealing with Japanese painters and uh, a very outstanding leader, an outstanding authority in Japanese art, made his criticism of Seku, listing his abilities uh, in the following arrangement and also explaining why Seshu enjoyed so noble a reputation. And in the order of importance, this very learned specialist uh, gave the abilities of Seshu in this way. First and most important, Seshu was a Zen monk. This was his first claim to fame. And in this claim to fame, it was supported by the fact that while he was in China, visiting a monastery there to study art, he was given a seat in the monastery next to the abbot. Now this is important. This makes for great art. So the first important thing about Seshu was that he was a monk and that while he was in China he was allowed to sit next to the abbot of an important then monastery. Obviously these are the basic qualifications of an artist under any conditions. The second reason why Seshu is considered great is because the most careful analysis of his life has indicated the continuing nobility of his character. By nobility of his character meant 
the loftiness of his concepts of life, his uh, innate appreciation of value, uh, the way he deported himself in countless trivial incidents which have been most carefully cherished and remembered. He was of noble character. His third qualification as an artist was that he possessed extraordinary depth of understanding, which enabled him to attain to the tenth grade of a painter. Now, this understanding says nothing whatsoever about mixing ink or anything of that nature. His depth of understanding was his penetration into the mystery of Zen. And he demonstrated this penetration in his famous painting of Daruma, the great patriarch of Zen, in which it is said that he broke through the entire framework of Daruma's mortality and revealed him as a pure principle of power in space. This was very important. This indicated extraordinary artistic capacity. The fourth reason why he was a great artist was that he chose to live simply. That in all things he maintained a gentle but dignified austerity. In his consciousness there was no luxury. In his entire life he never sought the applause of anyone. He never compromised his work to please anyone. Uh, he never made any effort, whatever, uh, to dignify his achievements. He never placed any value upon a painting. And whenever a, paint, a person asked him the price of his work, he replied, it is nothing, and gave it to him. Now this is regarded as simplicity of life and justifies the concept of a great painter. Uh, the next and last note on the list of credentials is that he had good technique. Now, this is an interesting point of view. In other words, he was an admirable artist. No one denied that. But that was not why he was great. That was not why he was revered in his own time and admired by those who came after him. His painting, of course, is consistent with this entire concept. He was essentially a Kumi artist. That is, he painted in black on white. Only in very slight and sometimes rather offhand manner are light color tones introduced into his work. Essentially, his work is Zen in the sense that it is bones. Bones drawn in black upon white. Bones in which the substance or essence of things is carefully picked out from all of its involvement. And one of his great scrolls, for which he is especially remembered, the scroll of the four seasons, unfolds slowly through the four great seasons of the year, identifying these seasons with the four degrees of human consciousness from infancy to maturity. And in these seasons we find nature magnificently depicted not merely for the purpose of representing artistically some composition, but in an effort to cause nature to speak, uh, to reveal its own essential structure beneath the surfaces of prettiness or transcendent uh, uh, overtones, uh, Sechu strikes for the fact, for the fact which he regarded as the most beautiful part of the entire composition. So it is quite obvious why he is so well remembered and so deeply respected. It was because to the Eastern mind, the great artist must in some way be a great person. Here is, I think, one of the conflicts that we have uh, in our art standards in the West, uh, somewhat, I fear, to the detriment of our Western standards. Uh, this is not intended to imply that uh, an artist in the West must be another Seshu or cannot paint a decent picture without being a Zen monk. That isn't the point at all. But the point is that we have been rather, we'll say, thoughtless in failing to recognize the relationship between character and production. To the Oriental mind, there must be good in anyone who does good things. 
And the problem always is it possible to discover this and uh, to recognize uh, that we have a right, in fact a duty, uh, to make certain that these things with which we surround ourselves are productions of consciousness. Uh, that when we are influenced, that we are influenced by something innately superior. That the influence itself may have importance or value to us. And this brings us to the particular problem of the evening, namely the philosophy of value. Looking in our English dictionary, for example, we find what has happened to our concept of value. In all definitions of a general nature in the dictionary, value is associated with economic worth. Value is how much is it worth. Not in terms of its nobility, but in terms of its cash equation. If a thing is worth a dollar and we pay a dollar for it, then we have value. If it is worth 50 cents and we pay a dollar for it, then we have no value or less value. And if it's worth two dollars and we pay a dollar for it, then it's a bargain. That is the way in which we think. Now, in uh, great art, from the earliest time, real artists have warned us against this. They have warned us that value is something which cannot be measured in terms of price. This doesn't mean that good things must be free, but it does mean that value must be present in order to have anything worth what we pay for it. So we must try to escape from the concept of value being always associated with price or with worth in terms of economic displacement or equivalent. Thus we have this word which we want to try to make something out of, kihin, which means literally moral value. Now moral value substantially means that the value must be constructive. A thing cannot be judged by meaning alone, because meaning may be either good or bad. It must be judged by moral value. It must be judged in terms of what it contributes to a total good. In what way it advances some legitimate purpose. Things that mean nothing in terms of value have no value. And regardless of how expensive they may become in our way of life, they are still valueless in terms of their contribution to us. The objects are something with which there is a common responsibility in nature. Anything that does something for us, we owe something to. Now, a beautiful picture that does something for us is a responsibility as well as an opportunity. Therefore, if we have gained from it, we must give certain consideration to this work of art. We must protect it. We must guard it as carefully as we can. We must cer make certain that when our stewardship over it ceases, that it will pass on to others whose tastes are similar to our own. One of the things that uh, Zen teaches us at a very early degree is that nothing belongs to anyone. Even Daruma doubted if we belong to ourselves. Uh, there is a grave question as to whether there is any proprietorship in the universe. Things, however, come into the keeping of people. And these people become custodians. They become protectors, guardians of values. And wherever such guardianship is established, it is usually a voluntary one. We surround ourselves with things of beauty because we feel that we need them, because we choose to have them, and perhaps because we choose to expend upon them uh, certain monetary facts uh, which we might otherwise direct to less valuable ends. Thus we have chosen these things for ourselves. We have paid for them, perhaps sacrificed other things in order to have them. Thus they become our wards, 
we are given a certain period of stewardship. If a piece of art is truly great, it may very well be quite old. This means that it descends to us only because a group of preceding stewards have been faithful in their protection of the value of that particular thing. They have served it as lovingly as a Japanese uh, might guard and take care of his bonsai tree, which will descend to him perhaps through five or six generations of his family. A week's neglect and the tree would be gone, but it comes to him not having been neglected even for a day by those of his ancestors who may have guarded it and loved it over a period of 200 years. Thus if a beautiful little object, a fine little bowl, a wonderful piece of carved jade, a magnificent example of crystal, comes to us, it comes to us because others have protected it, because for a long period of time it has been guarded against both natural and artificial hazards. Unfortunately, many great art treasures are gone and can never be revived or restored. But those that do come down, come down because of generations of faithful stewardship. Thus, when we receive this thing into our keeping, we already have a lesson in moral value, if we want to accept that lesson. We have the lesson of the time and the thought the sincerity and the contrition, the patience, the gentleness, and perhaps even the courage which has been involved in protecting beauty for its own sake over a long period of time. While it is true that many art objects change hands and pass into the keeping of the merchant, most uh, great collectors have held those things which they held most dear until their own passing. Therefore, these have become parts of their estates. The individual who owned them never sold them, never received any economic return for them. They were value as living things to that person. If his descendants wish to scatter them to other people, that is their right. But the person who really loves does not buy for a profit. He buys to keep, to enjoy, to cherish. And unless it is an inferior object which he outgrows, he will generally take care of it till the time of his passing. Many wills have contained important and interesting clauses relating to these types of heritages or uh, gifts from the past. De Goncourt, one of the great French collectors, left a special uh, note in his will stating that he did not wish these objects which he had assembled with such love and patience ever to pass into a museum or a gallery. He wanted his whole collection to be placed on the auction block and sold at one item at a time and one only, not as a group, but as single pieces, so that collectors all over the world who loved what he had loved might have an opportunity to acquire them. He did not wish them to be held, kept, or put away. He wanted others to immediately enjoy as soon as he could no longer enjoy. This type of thinking is a type of thinking that arises from the kind of value that is associated with art. And while it is true that many art collectors and dealers are simply uh, businessmen, these are not the real lovers of beauty. The real lover is the individual who carefully and lovingly guards what has brought joy and peace to his own nature. Now what is there in great art that is moral value? Why does it mean something in particular? That is a very hard question to answer because Art has particular meaning for every person. Art is very often the handmaiden of some other interest. It represents perhaps a contact between the individual and some area of his personal interests or his personal uh, thoughtfulness. Perhaps, for example, an individual who is greatly interested in history may find certain episodes or epics in history which he wishes to come into more immediate and intimate contact with. By becoming a collector of the arts and artifacts of that period, he feels himself able to bridge an interval of time. He can actually hold in his hands these things that once belong to a culture group with which he is deeply concerned. Thus, uh, art very often follows historical and archaeological interests. 
this uh, very often in turn adds to the enrichment of the life of the person. Uh, completely on the reverse, very often art opens interests. An individual who collects, uh, for instance, Chinese art over a period of years is very likely to become China conscious. He becomes more acutely aware of the cultural institutions, the religions, the philosophies, and all the things that added to the enrichment of the Chinese cultural life. Therefore, a door opens for him. Perhaps his art forms a bridge to a larger world of interests than might otherwise be his. This is quite important to many individuals, especially those who have more or less heavy routine responsibilities and who are therefore greatly intrigued by the possibility of moving thoughtfully into larger spheres of mental and emotional maturity. So art becomes a factor in all of these types of problems. Art sometimes follows some special interest in the life of the person. And we know that there are many individuals who have formed massive and important collections, uh, largely because of the fact that each new edition uh, gave a, a new sense of maturity to an inward drive that this person had. This drive, perhaps, to know or to appreciate or to value. Most all great collectors at various times have expressed themselves as to what art did mean to them. And nearly all agreed that it was a great civilizing force. More than this, that it was a great training of the powers of observation and reflection. Uh, the art collector becomes peculiarly observant. And while this observant quality may be only symbolic when directed against an object of particular artistic uh, beauty, it becomes the basis of a larger attentiveness toward other things in life. Uh, the, the art lover finds beauty in itself a power of bringing peoples together. That through the sharing of beauty we seem to share in the souls of people. For beauty appears to be a form of soul expression. The creativity of the artist what his ideal hope and patience meant suddenly comes to us through his work and we share in a certain degree in the maturity of his dream and in the self-sacrifice and patience by means of which a noble work was accomplished. Art also lifts the individual to a measure from the commonplace of values. Art carries the person from a world in, of barter and exchange into a world of delicate overtones, overtones which do help us to realize the essential power of soul consciousness in the life of man. We get very critical of human beings sometimes, and we become very critical of cultures and of races and of nations. But this tendency to be critical is softened and sometimes completely overcome by a contact with the arts of that people. We suddenly realize that a group cannot be completely bad, which can produce great good in art. That the love of beauty indicates a certain maturity and refinement where often we least expect to find it. We also sense the honesty, the integrity, the dynamic uh, endeavor of the folk artist and how primitive man, seeking to express his convictions and ideals, released his soul through art endeavor. Thus we become a little more democratic, a little more universal in our appreciations of things. Distant places seem to come nearer. Old things seem to take on a modern light. Modern things sort of mingle with the ages, and art stands forth as an eternal symbol of man's search for pure beauty. And he cannot make this search unless there is a great goodness in him, a great value in him. And this, more or less, we begin to sense as we sense and appreciate his insight, his creativity, the marvelous designs and patterns which he is able to create. 
Art, therefore, gives us great psychological insight. It, it makes us more and more aware that there is something in life except high taxes and bobs. We also realize that in a wonderful way, even the failures of man uh, cannot deny the essential integrity that is locked in consciousness. And we find this integrity in all peoples and in all levels of consciousness, in all times. And we gain a certain faith, a certain understanding and friendship that we might not ever otherwise ever be able to enjoy. The next point that perhaps is important to us in the problem of Zen is the disciplining of ourselves in the matter of what we might term moral value. In our modern way of life, the average person is unable to judge, for the most part, uh, what might be termed abstract value. Uh, we can judge uh, comparative costs and comparative prices, and we can be terribly influenced by so-called experts. Many persons today in our Western life who collect art are simply victims of dealers. They have no understanding, no actual comprehension of art themselves. They are told something is good, it is proven to them that it is good because it is expensive, and they thereby consider themselves collectors. Uh, in uh, the true world of art, this would not be considered anything short of uh, savagery. There is no such pattern in the essential values of things. Therefore, the Western person uh, seemingly has never become exceedingly skillful in the determination of art value. Of course, there have been exceptions, uh, but whereas most nations of the world have developed at least a deep appreciation for their own art. Art appreciation is comparatively poor in the Western Hemisphere. Now this in itself may not mean too much, but your Zen will warn you that where this appreciation is poor, other forms of appreciation are also poor, and that the individual who is unable uh, to use some discrimination in determining that which is right, fit, proper, or valuable, will also have great trouble on the level of industry, economics, politics, family relationships, and every other decision area in his life. We must have some standard to determine the difference between good, better, and best. We must have some instinctive appreciation of value. Not having this appreciation of value injures us ethically. The way where we cannot appreciate value as beauty, we are likely to neglect value as honesty. Where we do not have any clear concept of that which is really best, uh, we are likely to be imposed upon deceived uh, and disappoint, disappointed time after time in all of the simple problems of daily living. Thus our art become involved in our lives, not perhaps because we will ever be collectors, but because as appreciators uh, we give moral force to the things which we accept. What we buy the manufacturer will make. What we watch, we will get again on television. What we pay theater tickets to see will be the performances that will be given. If there is no discrimination, if there is no essential value, if there is no cultural censorship uh, by the person who is the potential customer, then we can expect very little growth or development in our arts, in our cultures, in our ethics, our morality, or any other form of essential moral good. If our religious life is not clear, if we do not sustain the religious principles which are obviously right, we cannot hope that these principles will ever become dominant in our culture. If our philosophical speculations are so amateurish that we are never able to rationalize any idea sufficiently, we will be imposed upon by innumerable false doctrines, and our personal conduct will fall short of excellence. 
Thus, uh, the recognition of value becomes highly important to us. It becomes highly important to us even in terms of appearance, because the individual who does not know how to select his own clothing with a certain artistry is simply selling himself short as a personality. Wherever he does not have what we might term good taste, he is going to suffer from the consequences of poor taste. And these consequences are not merely personal. These consequences reach out into the larger areas of his living and have something to do with the structure of his economics and his industries. All these things are part of one grand pattern. And the answer to the pattern always, in good product, in good material, in good merchandise, is the intelligent customer. He is the one who must decide. There will be no shoddy goods unless he will buy it. There will be no imposture in business unless he will accept it. There will be very little corruption in politics unless he will tolerate it. So that in the last analysis, the value standard of the individual is his greatest protection in life. It not only supplies him uh, with an immediate clarity of insight, which can be economically most profitable in these days, but it also gives him moral force in the determining of the way of life which he is going to live. The voice of the people remains the voice of God, but when the people says nothing, then there is nothing to be said. Thus, our moral value problem is to determine these standards within ourselves. What constitutes the good, the beautiful, and the necessary in our own way of life? To come to some, some conclusions on this matter will enrich us in terms of culture and probably enrich us somewhat economically because we will save ourselves a vast amount of useless expenditure. It will also give us greater mental and emotional leisure because the wrong selection of value very often carries with it heavy penalties in wasted time, sorrow, grief, worry, fear, and doubt. So Zen goes after this keynote of how shall we build a life of value. One of the uh, things that we have always had to uh, worry about and which have uh, which has been mentioned repeatedly in lines of great art is the importance of simplicity in beauty. The average person has not learned that man covers his mistakes with various elaborate devices, that it is nearly always true that your, un, uh, that your unworthy product will be more elaborate than your valuable product. It is uh, almost certain to be uh, definitely proven that where the individual has sessu, a sessu head, is in complete control of the dynamic principles of things, he does not have to fall into ostentation. Now we can take an example of value and the attitude of the world toward it in the problems of modern art. But uh, we are not going into a tirade on the moderns. I'm going to pause for a moment in the 18th and ninth, early 19th century for some of our horrible examples. Uh, this will protect us against being considered unkind to the contemporaries. Uh, today, uh, there is a grave amount of question in the West. Now we'll go back to Western man. Because in spite of all the mistakes we make, Western man does grow. His cultural insight is better than it was. The most difficult problem that we face is the intentional uh, misdirection of that insight. We are constantly misleading Western man in nearly everything of value. Occasionally, however, he wakes up and asserts himself. Now, we had an exceedingly bad period in art uh, during the late 18th and early 19th century that produced uh, some of the most spectacular but least desirable of so-called famous artists. And to give a good quotation, Gainsborough. Now, Gainsborough is probably admired a good deal by many people. Uh, but the works of the Gainsborough Romney 
uh, period are not good, regardless of how we may look at them. Uh, they are masterpieces of technical work, but Kihin is absent. They have no moral meaning. They are not important. Therefore, the history, and uh, you will see this uh, by studying recent texts on the subject, the history of the art of this period is economically most discouraging. Uh, many wealthy collectors, 50 or 100 years ago, paid fabulous sums for these paintings. Some of the Gainsborough and Romney paintings and Lawrence and some others brought as high as a half a million dollars. Today, those paintings could not be sold for ten cents on the dollar. We've caught up to them. We have suddenly realized uh, that they had one of the great deficiencies. They were utterly dated. They fitted into a time, a period, an architecture, and a type of home furnishing. They belonged to a certain psychology of life. That psychology of life became utterly decadent. Modern man no longer values it. Therefore, he no longer values these paintings. Uh, they are charming. There is no reason why anyone can en can't enjoy them who wants to, but they are not great art. And we have caught up with it. Therefore, we no longer value them. And it would be almost impossible to do very much with them. Uh, paintings by a very famous uh, woman painter, Rosa Bonheur, uh, which were fabulous at the time of her life, particularly her paintings of animals, most of them on huge canvases, uh, with a whole um, a group of horses, all life-size. These paintings brought two, three hundred thousand dollars when they were painted or shortly thereafter. Today you can buy them for ten or fifteen thousand dollars and still uh, be doing the dealer a service. Uh, these paintings are no longer respected. They are no longer great because they are dated. So we will find that a great part of post-Renaissance art in Western culture is dated. We no longer admire it. We no longer consider it great art. But go back to the primitives and you will find no bargains. You will find that the Western art of the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, the great art of the early Middle Ages, the great Gothic art, the work that was done by uh, the great artists of those times, particularly the ones that had, like Durer, a tremendous sense of Zen in those fingers which carved those wooden blocks, those pieces of art will never be cheaper because we have discovered in them a timelessness. They did not belong to a decadent cycle of production. So the primitive so-called in European art become more expensive every day and the moderns less so. There's a reason for this. There is a reason why the individual has gone back to what might be termed primitive line, gone back to power of design, gone back to impact and meaning, and perhaps most of all, significance. He has rediscovered moral value in these older works, value which he does not find, does not find the same psychic satisfaction in these products, which are obviously pretty, but are not beautiful. So this thing has been an experience to Western man also, and he is experiencing more and more of this in terms of his architecture, in terms uh, of music, in terms of literature. There is a great breaking up of patterns now and a consistent search for that which is essentially shibui, which has the astringency of greatness, which is not overly luxurious, which is not extravagant, uh, which is not uh, the evidence of some kind of status but is really a pure and clear statement of meaning, of, of dignified and powerful impact upon the beholder and the possessor. This would be in perfect harmony with the Zen thinking on this type of thing, and therefore gives us another lesson in what I would say is the essential of value, simplicity. 
Greatness can afford to be simple. The great speeches that have changed the course of history have been short speeches, not long ones. Uh, the great orators whose words have come down to us with undying glory have used simple words. Perhaps the simplest words that we have, the most powerful words that we have in the Western world will be found in the Sermon on the Mount. The tremendous strength of these words. Words without embellishment, without any effort at great literary excellence. Ideas that are not drowned in words, but words which are used sparsely, uh, very humbly, very directly. Words used in this way for one reason only, namely that the person who used them knew what he intended to say and was therefore able to say these words simply, directly, and powerfully. The same type of expression when drowned in words comes to be almost meaningless. The dead silence that followed Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, a silence which he misunderstood to be derision, but which was really a silence that came from people who were no longer able to speak but were tremendously overwhelmed by the simple words of this gaunt man who made no effort to make a great speech and as a result made one of the greatest speeches of all time. This simplicity is key. This is the very thing uh, that, is co that comes as a natural gift to some people, but to others has to be acquired through a patient understanding of value. And this in our way of life today is especially meaningful to us because we are luxury ridden. And in the very mass of our luxuries, we've lost our value. We have even lost the power to enjoy. The more of these complications pile up, the less happy we are. And living as we live today, in probably the most exaggerated era of finance the world has ever known, with everyone living on a standard above anything previously possible to man, still a miserable generation of sick, unhappy people. This is because Zen is lacking. This is because the individual has not been able to cut through the superficial and to discover the essential nature of things that are real. To find reality, therefore, we must constantly seek for simplicity realizing that complexity is a continual o uh, over and open opportunity for deceit. Wherever there is complexity, weakness can be hidden. Wherever long words are used, we are not sure of meaning. Maybe the person who used them wasn't sure either. Uh, many and many, a very bad conclusion has been dramatically concealed in classic Latin. Therefore, we cannot trust these things. But we can always trust tremendous simplicity, the dynamic of the exact thing, that which is not too much and not too little. Not too much, lest it become a burden. Not too little, lest we be impoverished for lack of it. But always these things proper, correct, and enough. This type of thinking suggest certain disciplines which we can impose upon our own natures. Now, the problem of discipline has always been a little difficult to Western man because he always thinks of improvement in terms of labor. This is another Zen fallacy. Western man, for the last 2,000 years, has been nursing the idea that he had to suffer in order to be good, that his real distinction in life was gained by being miserable. If he could prove that he was worried to death or heartbroken, he was a citizen of distinction. This type of thinking is totally unrealistic. But as a result of it, we have made virtue seem to be so desperate and dismal a venture that the only possible relaxation is to cling to vice. This is wrong thinking. It is poor from a Zen standpoint. Now, we also uh, know that in our search for meaning, we are more skillful but unfortunate than we realize. Most people have an uncanny ability uh, to find some kind of a meaning in everything that happens. 
And in most cases, it's a bad meaning. As, as the result of that, we are devoted to the continuous search and quest for ulterior motive. If we can just knock down the virtues of other people, we feel that this is a way of attaining a democratic level, that anyone who appears to be superior must be discredited, and that actually behind every hero lurks some miserable vice-ridden form which we must discover. This in itself means that in our search for meaning we have become critics, uh, that we have instinctively developed the bad habit of doubting everything. Well, many people will say we come by this trait rather honestly. We have been deceived too frequently. We have been constantly exposed to so many disillusionments and disappointments that we have a right to suspect the worst. These disappointments and disillusionments, however, were not really the result of what other people did to us. They were the result of the fact that we did not understand moral value. We did not recognize the very clear symptoms and symbols which could have protected us. Because we had no standard, we were deceived, and then promptly turned upon the deceiver. And because we still have no standards, we continue to attempt to destandardize practically everything with which we come in contact. Today our natural tendency is to be suspicious of everything and everyone. What we need, therefore, is simply to redirect this energy. We have it. We do not live in a universe uh, without meaning, but we live in a universe of bad meaning. We live in a threatening universe. We live surrounded by threatening circumstances. Our observation nearly always reveals the weaknesses in things, or the perfidity in them. All we have to do then is to gain a different uh, level of insight. We are using this energy all the time, but it is not making us happy. It's not enlarging our lives or enriching us. It is simply making us more and more suspicious, more and more disillusioned, and more and more critical of the world in which we live. Zen, of course, goes after this situation with a very definite philosophy. And that is this philosophy of never, never expecting anything to be other than what it is, but expecting all things to clearly reveal their natures if we have the wit to understand. Therefore, we cannot deceive or be deceived if we ourselves have this power to measure value. The moment we apply it, uh, our troubles diminish. And instead of being lonely intellectuals, we become much more useful human beings. Another important thing that the West seems to have, have gotten a wrong notion about, which I think Zen can help with considerably, is that in our search for value, we nearly always think of value as something spiritual. If we are thinking of positive moral value, we, have begin, we immediately begin to think theologically. Uh, this Zen would not tolerate for a moment. Uh, the purpose is not to change life into a series of sermons. We are not supposed to simply go out and, and see in the universe nothing but a vast unfoldment of theological dogma. This is not the end which we are concerned with. We are, in, we are concerned rather with the fact of things. The fact of things really is the only spiritual reality there is, but this is a spiritual reality that is absolutely non-theological. Uh, the discovery of God in Zen, or the discovery of principle in Zen, is not regarded primarily as a religious experience. It is regarded merely as a normal use of function. That the individual should see good does not mean that he is necessarily superior. It merely means that he is normal. Thus, then, throws great emphasis upon normalcy as being greater than so-called superiority. Normalcy carries with it penetration.